For Cremo Media's Policy, I'm Sash Nimadi. Joining me today is lawyer and author Oyama Mabandla, here to discuss his book, Soul of a Nation, A Quest for the Rebirth of South Africa's True Values. Can you talk us through your early politicization, which you detail in your book, and tell us why 17 became a star-crossed age for your parents? <laughs> well, it became a star-crossed age for my parents because that's the year we both left home for exile. Myself in 1980, my brother in 1981. As I say in the book, we were a political family. We, we grew up in that intellectual family where politics were discussed and they were, if you like, part of the family staple. And, uh, you know, by the time I was 13, June 16, uprisings erupted. I was kind of ready for that moment because I'd already been sufficiently politicized intellectually. Uh, so when that moment arose, uh, I was ready for it. I, I, I understood what undergirded it. And, uh, you know, that's the reason I was on the barricade when I was in Cape Town that December 1976, because I identified with what the youth was agitating for and was in solidarity with them. It was my struggle. And, but it came, as I say, because intellectual, I'd already been prepared for that moment. Now, your book, as you said, discusses your exile during the apartheid years and the quest for home. Can you tell us why you say that exile goes beyond the physical separation from a native place? The way I use exile, as I say, in contradistinction to how Edward Said, who was one of my mentors, refers to it, exile is alienation, not just from a physical space, but it could be just from your psychic home yourself when you are not fully at home in the sense of fully actualized as a human being in some respects we're in exile you're exiled from the self the psyche in what i call your ontological home you describe south africa's 1994 freedom deal as a compromise and you say that to be born black or white meant being born on a different footing which could be used to describe what has gone wrong in the Rainbow Nation. Can you just talk more on that? The agitation, if you like, from the freedom fighters were for a revolution. A revolution means a complete overhaul of uh, the political economic system. And that we did not achieve. Ultimately, because of the difficulties of waging what we called our strategic thrust, which was the arms seizure of power. It could not happen. It didn't happen. So in the end, we sat down, you know, with our foes and negotiated a settlement. And a settlement by its nature is never perfect. It is perfectible. By that, I mean that through legislative enactments, through the agitation by civil society, by the electorate, by the voters, you can get to that desired place without revolution. You can get to it through parliamentary democracy. And that is what we had because we did not vanquish the apartheid state. We had a parliamentary democracy guided and underguided by the constitution. And we could achieve whatever we wanted through that framework. And the constitution, I mean, as I say, if you wanted uh, to nationalize all the commanding heights of the economy and all of those, and there was sufficient consensus in the polity about that. By sufficient consensus, I mean we had over two thirds of the electorate saying we support a complete overhaul of everything so we can get that which we didn't get through revolutionary measures. So it was still possible. You know. Your book also points out that we don't have a common understanding of the history of South Africa's democratic breakthrough, which could be a danger, you say. How so? Well, if you start from the premise that the 1994 pact deal was a treacherous denouement, then as many in our society, they will reject, if you like, the constitutional state, 
They think something that you should touch, they should rebel against, agitate against. Um, and that's what I mean, that if we don't have understanding that there were limits to our claims as a revolutionary movement, which forced us in the negotiating table to achieve a constitutional dispensation. And the constitutional dispensation by its nature is guided by rules, by founding or foundational principles. You don't just wake up and say, I'm taking your house, as would happen in China, for example. If the guys who've essentially assumed what amounts to near divine power, that is a party in China, decides we're doing this thing, and they do it. You know, in this country, we can't do that. The citizen is empowered to challenge public action. Now, you also talk about the controversial growth, employment, and redistribution strategy in your book. And you believe that it did not sell out South Africa, but that it had rescued it. Can you talk us through that? Well, I think I, in the book, I enumerate that the GDP, employment, you know, the interest we're paying, inflation, all of those things were going south. And again, we inherited a bankrupt state, bankrupted by sanctions and apartheid, fraud and criminality and corruption. And this apartheid state, the apartheid economy had been junked. It was in a junk status by the time we took over in 1994. And after the implementation of the growth and redistribution strategy in 1996, five years later, we emerged. I mean, that's a concrete, that's a signifier, you know, of the fact that gear began to pay dividends. And as I say, if you look at all the other indicators, they were all improving under gear. One that did not improve is the Gini coefficient. Inequality did not decrease. But if you talk about per capita, per capita income, you know, debt to GDP, the growth rate of the economy, I mean, we even had a surplus that this country had not seen, I believe, since the 60s, 70s. So on concrete terms, in spite of its weaknesses in other regards, Gear put us on a growth path, you know, which would enable us to experiment persistently, consistently, and perhaps improve on the outcomes we're already achieving. Well, I think that is what happens in a constitutional democracy. It is consistent and persistent experiment. Nothing is ever perfect. It improves, yeah. Now, you also advocate for a CODESA II, another convention for a democratic South Africa. Why? Well, it's clear to me that the Pact of 1994 is fraying. As, as I've just answered, you know, we don't, we don't actually even have a common vision of the history of this country. Others say it was a sellout. Others say it was a proper, you know, compromise between two claimants. African nationalism and African nationalism at some point, because we couldn't defeat each other, we sat down and constructed a future for our country. But the country is in difficulty, it is ailing. All indicators are pointing south. You know, uh, I mean, when you have a 42% unemployment rate, you're using a broader measure. Hospitals not working, education, you know, in the townships and rural areas collapsing, uh, infrastructure. Uh, you know, that is creaking. You have a rail system that can deliver goods, you know, to the ports, ports that are congested. If power outages, something has gone wrong, you know, in the Rainbow Nation. And we saw its potent. What could happen when the people uh, no longer believe, you know, in the South African dream, voter participation, you know, when close to 70% of your people no longer bother, eligible voters no longer bother, it means they've lost hope in elections and politics at the level for for transformational change. What do people do when no longer believe in the common good, which is our participation jointly as a citizenry in making our country better? Violence, the type of violence we saw in 2021 erupts it can easily become a feature, a norm of the new South Africa. So that calls for everything. 
for some of the things that um you know it that seems to me clearly not to be working i mean you know, after 30 years i think it's the perfect time to examine and say is what we've been doing in the last 30 years working and in certain respect we'll say yes and in other respect we'll say no i mean if you talk about when 70 percent of the population is not coming out to vote do you actually have a representative democracy one two would it improve if you change the electoral system so that I can elect my representative and hold him to account? At the end of every two months, three months, whatever, you know, uh, tenure is, delin is delineated, he or she comes to a town hall and I can ask him the questions about things I do not like, about Ngandla. You know, Ngandla, as, as, as electorate, we had no voice in it. Because our public representative at the ANC were taking instructions from Lutuli House, from Gwede Mandasha. It didn't matter what you and I, you know, felt, what the general citizen felt. It was what the political bosses wanted. And I don't think, you know, that that's an optimal democratic framework where the citizen, you know, does not have the ability to force accountability from his or her representative. So that's one of the things that I think we need to revisit in Codessa. I mean, the other things, you know, like I said, there are things that we are fighting over, you know, national health insurance on big basic income grant. Now, all of those things can actually just become, uh, if you like, policies of whoever wins the election, you know, you get the mandate from the electorate to enact that type of what you call. But it does seem to me that something that seismic requires some kind of consensus, you know, from business, from labor, society, you know, academia, it's measured and you can, it's not used for political advantage, for political purchase. That we sit here and we can say, this is what this country needs. And then the details, the scale, the scope of it then is becomes a matter for politics. Yeah. So some of the basic contours of our democracy that I believe are cricking require some kind of gathering, you know. Uh, and, you know, if you look at uh, other major democracies, you know, uh, I mean, in the U.S., you know, they sat down after... 1789, to, to, to design a, a constitution that still holds to this day. I mean, it's got its own defects. It did, it did not recognize certain members of that you know, community, black people, women. And there were you know, amendments to the constitution that happened you know, later on where with the 15th and the 20th amendment, you know, black people, 14th amendment, black people and women got to vote. But if you look at the fundamental strain of the U.S. democracy, you know, what may actually bring Trump back to power shows me that certain things, certain, there's a consensus about slavery, about the treatment of black folk that was never resolved fundamentally. It's a kind that needs to have another contestant to look into that. Just like I think we need to look into our own efficacy is governance being effectively delivered to the electorate. And I think if you if you conducted a referendum, I think the majority of people will say no. It's, it, 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 the ANC will still win the election, I'm sure. But the unhappiness, the disquiet, the dissent in society remains where some of these issues have not been addressed. And some of the things that you know, we saw before 1994, I mean, a retreat into tribal lagers, racial lagers, I think is happening at a frightening rate. The rainbow nation is free. Yeah. And lastly, as you've just mentioned, and as your book mentions, uh, in 2021, only 30% of registered voters turned up to the polls in the local government election. As we head into a crucial national election in May this year, what do you hope your book, which sets out proposals for healing South Africa's injured soul, can achieve? Well, I think it can begin to instigate a discussion and a debate about where we are as a country. 
are we at a happy place? And and I think the answer to that is a resounding no. We're not in a happy place. So some of the things I I, I suggest in the book, as I said, the pivot points are not conclusive. You know, I say the Cortesa too, for example, to look into the political and economic architecture of this country. Education, I think that's something that screams that if you're failing to educate your people, you're condemning them to a failed future. You know, that's something that we need to, you know, to address as a matter of agency. Issues of culture, the arts, you know, we know when we grew up, you know, we we live arts with, with arts around us, liberation arts. There was arts around us. Now, today, artists are going to bed hungry. There's something about the new South Africa that does not honor and vindicate what was an important vector of the struggle for freedom. Uh, and ultimately, I'll talk about issues of spirituality, you know. Uh, that And spirituality for me is a very simple proposition. Do unto others as you want done to you. I'm not, I'm not saying anything that uh, I think is, 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 is anathema or alien to most of us. We all want to genuinely deepen the solidarity bonds between us as citizens. That is the, that, that's what constitutes a citizen, you know. Um, someone was saying to me, actually, with regards to the book, but when you talk about certain values, what are certain values? You know, I can understand Americans. Americans have something called the American way, you know. I'm saying that American way is fraying. So South African values for me is that ethos that informed if you like, the struggle and ultimately the constitution. The constitution is imbued by certain values. That constitutional values, we call them constitutional values, but ultimately, if you look at them closely, the values that emanate from that I've just described to you, do unto others as you'd want done unto you, a spiritual community. You know. That was Oyama Mabandla discussing his book, Soul of the Nation.